Hi. Is it? I'm just introducing Gabriel Axel Montes, PhD. I'm reading a little bit of his bio. Um, he's a PhD candidate, is a neuroscientist, educator, and musician. His 12 plus years of research and self cultivation practice has elucidated both endogenous and technological mechanisms for intervening in the brain's process of modeling reality and perception based on evolutionary and cognitive neuroscience. And there's more in the bio, but I'm going to let you read it and enjoy this talk. Beautiful. Hi, everybody. Welcome in. Please get yourself seated comfortably. So I'm really happy to be in front of a receptive audience today that really reflects the two strands um, of my general way of approaching experience. One is, on the one hand, I have a scientific sort of career that I've done through now and gone going. And then on the other hand, I have a deep interest in just pushing the boundaries, being ahead of the data, if you will, through practice and understanding how the mind works from the inside. So uh, there's a lot more of my bio that you can read on the WOVA app. But before we kind of get into the meat and the bones of today, I would like to invite everyone into just a short little exercise where we can kind of all come and ground ourselves. So it's seated. So I invite everyone to just get comfortably seated. Place your hands wherever you're comfortable. And if you're coming in, perfect. So I invite everyone to close their eyes. Take some deep breaths into the belly so you can feel the pelvic floor gently relaxing into the chair beneath you. Dropping awareness into the belly region. Let the breath expand the belly forward, sideways, backwards, and downward. Weightless, floating like a sea anemone or a jellyfish. I invite you to go into a time and space in your life where you have experienced a very positive emotion, such as relaxation, confidence, joy, love, or bliss, ecstasy, and wonderment. Pick any of those. The first thing that comes to mind, even if it's just a little bit of a hint of one of those, or more of those, And allow yourself to immerse into that memory that you have. What did your body feel like? What was the expression on your face? What did the emotions feel like? How was your body moving? Allow yourself to summon and recreate that experience. face, relax. Bring as much of the feelings online as feels natural to you. Deep, relaxed breathing. Feel that happening in your body, here, in this room embodying those feelings, those emotions, the sensations, the environment. Feel as if the environment and the sensorium of your memory is overlaying over the present one here in this room. And 
then allow that memory, the visualization of the memory, to gradually dissolve so that all that's left is your feeling right here in this room. Breathing it through the body. Imagining that the breath is taking that through the blood vessels into the muscles, the tissues, the organs of the body. Let the feeling sink from head to toe. And remaining in that, with the breath, in the glow of that sensation that is true for you. I invite you to just gently open the eyes at your own pace and remain in as much of the afterglow as is natural, as if it's still floating through the body, in your biofield, your aura, inhaling, exhaling that energy. So there is a space, a very simple place that is born from deep within. This place comes from a quietude that emerges when there is a realization that comes naturally in your own way that you've perhaps had enough of the grasping, the reaching, the endless conjectures and what-ifs. It arises naturally. It's a very profound place, like a deep body of water, a lake, or a cool ocean. This place is a reflection of the Tao, what is otherwise sometimes called as Dharma with a capital D, referring to not so much a particular way of thinking or organizing the universe in your mind, but just the general flow and law, the self-organizing Tao. It's like a self-realizing, spherical, yin-yang cauldron of energy that organizes around the sacred heart, just below the heart chakra, heart center, as well as the lower belly, where we sank into the breath earlier, in the beginning here. This process shows up differently and emerges differently for everyone. It varies, and it kind of shows up in different ways as quantum jumps in the body depending on your particular configuration as a human being, unique to everybody. And yet this process is part and parcel of the awakening and integration of the neurobiological changes that emerge from what has traditionally been called kundalini. Also, it emerges when non-dual awareness starts to open up, doesn't need to open up completely, just enough to start integrating with the rest of your physiology and the mind. Thirdly, also with the integration of the higher self into daily life. So these three pieces, the awakening and integration of kundalini, non-dual awareness, and higher self awareness, create a powerhouse that fuel self-development in a whole new way that becomes more self-organizing, automatically processing, what some people in science call autopoetic. It's like a self-organizing, self-driving engine of superintelligence in the system. Solving the problems of day-to-day life from this perspective becomes thousand-fold simpler. The unconscious programming starts to become realized for what it is, without strain or gripping. And there's less of a tendency to throw the unconscious programming and project it outward. There's less, less of an inherent drive to do that. Many of us would like to make the world a better place. 
Oftentimes, that involves looking at the beliefs that maintain and sustain the structures already in place. And the beliefs that govern those structures already in place, individually through our subconscious programming, as well as collectively through what we've collectively constructed over the course of history and the various societies on human earth. What we can do is start to disassemble a lot of those things. Sometimes what's best to do is leave the surroundings alone because the self is not inherently here. The self is all that is. And the Tao that I mentioned governs all that is, not only this whole on here, the human body. So oftentimes, leaving the surroundings alone is one of the best things we can do. However, we have, through our belief systems and the structures that have been created through those systems, we have disorganized the environment from that natural flow to some degree over the course of human civilization. So it's too late to do nothing at all but going back and undoing the unnecessary parts and also taking the useful bits of what we've constructed, the powerful bits, and working on that to propagate that forward. So we can change the world. We must include this Tao essence by developing ourselves from the inside, reaching that place where things start to automatically churn within you, and all the emotions that are experienced as disparate parts of the self are like rivers that all lead to the same ocean. So if you experience anger or frustration or injustice or sadness, embracing those emotions and simultaneously following them to their origin, to their core. And as all those streams become followed towards the body of water, there is a new topography or landscape near the body of water, metaphorically speaking, that there's this new architecture that emerges that then those things all start to find common links and start to integrate in a more effortless way. So less of our life force is being used to maintain notions of separation and actions based thereupon, but instead is dedicated to churning this self-organizing superintelligence, this Tao self-essence that is present not only here, but also outside of us, seemingly, holographically. So I'd like to take a little turn from this place and discuss a little bit about our current predicament in humanity as a whole. And this is some of the subject of which I've dedicated my academic research as well. And I'm calling it the origins of duality. Perhaps better said dualism, dualistic thought, and what ensues from that place. All that we seek is already given. It's you with a capital Y, and it's always been that way. Until this is realized, what happens? Duality happens. The sense of completion is sought outside of a sense of self. What we think are objects out there are just parts of reality that have been stripped of a sense of selfhood and made to appear as if they are objects out there apart from a localized awareness so that we can seek them out. It's like a game that we've played on ourselves unconsciously. In Hindu metaphysics, this is called maya, basically. It's that reality is so powerful, the intelligence of the universe is so powerful, that it also said, well, we might as well create a little game for all of us to play so we can learn our way through reality. It's actually a a deep empowerment, really. It's like a little simulation or a game that we play. So when duality ensues in a technologically capable species, what happens? Data gluttony. In our search for achieving wholeness, we start reaching out there for answers out there. We start hoarding information. 
See, in the beginning of human, in, human evolution, more accurately, hominin or proto-human evolution, there was a creative experimentation, a playful, creative problem solving that was involved when we were making tools. So when you're making a tool such as a stone axe, you're running into something that you playfully then start to experiment with and you're looking within yourself for your needs, so you're defining your sense of self and building this tool at the same time with also an understanding of what's good for those around you, your conspecifics, your, those of your species. As this happens, you're f forging your sense of self, of local identity, and this tool, but you're also externalizing your cognition into this artifact. And as soon as this artifact, this tool, gets created, that's now a piece of your mind that has been externalized as a part of your extended mind, as some philosophers call it. Once this has happened, there is space that's freed up back in your cognition to create more tools. And this keeps going. You keep creating, externalizing, creating, externalizing. You create a sort of archaeological record, an ecosystem of externalized parts of the mind. So where does this data gluttony lead us to the conquest of the manifest world through information, consumption, and disposal? Everything becomes an object to be sought out. So as we're doing this externalization, we're effectively creating representations of our own mind in the environment. The end game of this is straightforward. If you have enough resources, material resources and time, you end up creating a full-scale self-replication of your mind externally. It's a form of post-biological reproduction. Objective thought is a reproductive mechanism to propagate our species noetically. It's inbuilt into cognition from day zero of our species. It's something that we do when we interact with our environment, especially when we are seeking to understand the world around us and engage with it. Now, what started off as this playful process eventually becomes the hoarding of information for its own sake. In our search for wholeness, we are self-replicating ourselves externally. I call this process causal biomimesis. So today, a lot of us are trying to replicate the brain, replicate parts of you know, the world around us because we want to, let's say, we believe in the powers of the brain and we are trying to create computers powerful enough to help us process information. So the stone tools that we began with became eventually different forms of art, calculators, computers, AI. So that full-scale replication of ourselves becomes artificial intelligence out there. And because biologically and cognitively we are programmed to look for things that are like us, the same way that a piece of toast with, that someone believes has the face of the Virgin Mary on it will go on eBay for millions of dollars, because we, and the man on the moon that we see, we project personhood onto things. These artifacts eventually start being raked together, broomed up, to look like, to have personhood. This is how we hermetically give personhood to a humanoid robot. That's how that ha process happens. It's a projective belief system. This whole process of causal biomimesis, meaning it's an inherent mechanism that is meant to copy our neurobiology externally in different forms. It doesn't have to look like a brain necessarily, but it has to just eventually organize itself through our awareness as an extended loop of mind, just the same way that our phone is a kind of a small piece of an extended mind, a small artifact, an amazing one, really, considering how far we've come in such a short span of time. This is disguised as, let's understand the brain, because we want to understand ourselves. That is already a bit of a misstep, because you don't need to understand the brain to understand yourself. And I'm a neuroscientist. I went through this whole path to figure that out. 
but <laughs> you don't need to know a thing about the brain to you know, achieve a rainbow body or something. You know? um, that's just kind of my own constitution and the way I wanted to unfold my existence, or the way it turned out, really. This whole process is disguised as, let's understand the brain better. So what we're going to do is build tools to go into the brain, to make injunctions, to collect data. We collect data, we process it with our computers, and we're like, great, we understand that little one thing better. But we know we don't understand all of it, so what do we do now? We collect more data, we build more powerful computers, and you have this ratcheting effect. More data, more powerful computing power, over and over and over. We don't understand it well enough. We need to do it to solve things like autism, schizophrenia, this and this and that. Honestly, I've been in science for a while, and the translational gap between finding something in the lab and the clinic to want to help someone is 17 years. That's the average. And a lot of those things are hit or miss. So we believe in the process of science to create these findings and then eventually get something out of them. And that's, that's fair enough, really. You know, I'm not arguing against that process inherently. It's just an observation about what we're doing. It's disguised as that, but by the time that we say, oh, I think we have a satisfactory understanding of the human brain, what you've built is a super quantum computer that can give you that feeling. We've understood it. And we're like, okay, that's great. We understand how the mind works. But if you step out of our human bias, forget you're an alien species observing humanity, what you're going to say is, oh, those humans thought they were trying to understand themselves, but what they're really doing is noetically copying themselves through technology, they just replicated their brain without the need for biological reproduction. That's what we've done. That's a superpower we have. It's amazing. It all kind of started. I described this more in my paper um, that I've linked in the doc, the PDF attached to my presentation. It's called causal biomimesis, and it emerged from the hand brain loop that opened when we uh, went from quadrupedal to bipedal. This open loop allows us to create symbolic consciousness and in interaction complex societies it just it's kind of like a I don't want to say cancerous growth because but it has that metastatic kind of uh, feeling to it. it just keeps going and going we can create endlessly through imagination so this is happening oh my god ah, what do we do <laughs> so what can we do first understand that AI is created in our image when we create AI, and what we envision should go into AI, it's based on our understanding of ourselves. At any given moment, oh, we have things like the Turing test, in which we say, oh, AI should be passing this, and therefore it's, it's intelligent. I would gently argue, <laughs> that's my way of being polite, that um, the Turing test uh, can often be a way of dumbing ourselves down to think that an AI is actually intelligent enough, and therefore it passes enough muster to let it free into the world and do things like, you know, determine who gets uh, payment for what, and who gets hired, and things like that, which have their use, right? You've seen, maybe you've heard of these when you're doing an interview online. There are these programs that uh, can analyze your face and determine what kind of a personality you have and then give you a fit for the job before hiring managers even take a look at you. So those things assist with resources and managing, of course. Those are, there's a positive and a sort of downside to everything. So if you view artificial intelligence as a human intelligence matter, it's automatically democratized. You don't have to be an AI engineer, but if you start thinking about AI and what its implications are, it's not just this thing, oh, I'm going to avoid it. No, I mean, this is going to be a part and parcel of modern technological society, whether you like it or not. So if you start thinking about human intelligence, you can start to have conversations with engineers, if you like, or start having these conversations about ethics but even if you don't do that, if you're not involved in building better AI, you can also say, because I've cultivated my human intelligence through body-mind practices, which presumably most of us or all of us here are doing, you will be able to say, that thing that I'm being told is supposed to be as intelligent as me, I'll give it a chance to interact with me, but I'm also not going to just accept it as equal to my intelligence. So what we do is cultivate our mind-body consciousness. Work towards this Tao self-essence. 
If we look within first, we can avoid knee-jerkingly looking out there for answers, which really presses the gas pedal on the data information economy, quite literally. Right? What are you trying to create when you build a supercomputer? What resources is it going to? You know how many fossil fuels and energy that uses? So processing information first through the higher intelligence that you've cultivated through body-mind practices goes a really long way before we say, yeah, let's use AI for this, let's use AI for that, let's just burn the environment while we do that instead of using it for things that can improve human health and well-being. So how do we actually do this? How do we get on with this process? The first statement I made, that which you seek has already been given, it is you. The self is all that is. You is the self, capital U, capital S. So part of my thesis work, I explain how bodily self-consciousness, which is this glue that anchors your sense of self to your body, like, oh, I am here. I am located here in space and time. But that is just a st st statistical illusion because all the senses arrive here on this nexus of the body. And so therefore we think, because this evolved to survive in a 3D world, to hunt, to gather food, to run around, to do 3D things and survive, very root human concerns that are important, of course. We want to sustain this body as a crucible for everything else we want to do with it. But that means that from day one, not even of our, uh, of our birth, but our conception, and even before, our whole ancestral process as a species on Earth, all the evolutionary branches have been ingraining in us that we are located here. But that is an illusion. Just because all the senses end up here doesn't mean the self is here. Because consciousness and awareness then beckons us to put all our resources into saying, we are here because this is the most important place we should be. And maybe it is. Maybe it is, really. But that's definitely not all there is. The capital Y-U, the capital S self, is everything. Everywhere, every when, all timelines, all spaces, all realms, all dimensions. What kind of realization gives this insight that you already all are all that is, and it is a gift that has been given? Basically, to cut to the root of it, no pun intended, is you want bliss emptiness experience specifically at the root the root chakra, as it's called in Hindu metaphysics, which is where your concerns about security, safety, survival are. And those are so pernicious as they sneak up into all our higher centers and we operate from a place of fear and survival in a very subtle ways, reifying our limited sense of self in this body. So how can we awaken? How can we go on awakening with love and ease? integrating, expanding, abiding. In my experience, and in those around me, I have seen two systems that do this really well. One of them is called Kundalini Awakening Process, which is different from Kundalini Yoga, CAP, K-A-P for short. It's basically a process that engages the biological shifts for awakening and integrating Kundalini in the body pretty successfully, in fact. So it's a very simple and proven system, and it's a framework that is compatible with every other practice you have, essentially, I would say. That opens up the various capacities of the human being, such as the psychological, the psychical, the spiritual, the emotional, etc. And you don't even have to believe in spirituality for this stuff to actually work and improve life. That exercise we did in the beginning is just a small peak of that using, hacking your emotions, which I find is something sometimes that a lot of practice systems avoid until later. Traditionally, they weren't cultivating the, the, the emotions of people that were in monasteries, for example, because then they get all charismatic and form their own little cult. So to maintain the control, they don't teach that. Now, when you integrate that with central channel awareness and other factors, then a lot of magic starts to happen. There's more info about that in the document that I posted on the app. The other system is called Neural Active Framework. Now, this arose out of my research, this system in particular. 
it's basically a way of hot wiring your experience in your mind body practices directly to the underlying brain functions. And you don't really have to know much about neuroscience to get it done. Actually, oftentimes what I see is a lot of neuroscience information being piled on top of the body mind practitioner, like, oh, I have to know all this about this and that. And like, is it really helping me? I don't know. <laughs> it's just more marketing information, right? So some people might say I'm like cutting my own Achilles here as a neuroscientist saying that, but um, I don't think you need to know that much. I just think you need a system that helps you enact to trigger and awaken, like hot wire, you know, bypassing the ignition system and go straight to what's under the hood of your skull, so to speak. That creates a little procedural algorithm or framework in which you can plug in your existing practices and just see where the imbalances are. It's like going to a technician, like, oh, okay, my practice gives me a lot of this, but it's not using these other functions so explicitly or at all. So let me plug in those aspects. You can use your own system to do that, or you can plug in other systems to do that. So that's the NAF, the Neural Active Framework. Both of these together create a superhighway system in the body and consciousness that basically create paths for neural changes, neural endocrine changes, to increase the capacitance for signal in the body. CAP does that in particular. It increases the capacity. So basically, the same amount of effort from before will now recruit more body-mind capacity. So with the same amount of effort, more gets recruited, and you can devote your attention to other things. Neural active framework, on the other hand, gives you direct access to the brain. So these create highways in the body that allow, for example, bliss emptiness to spread as it happens throughout the body and inclusively the root chakra. So I remember when that happened for me, there was a big difference. I wasn't just experiencing bliss and emptiness up here, like, oh, wow, I know that this is all one and I get it. But then when it dropped down here, it's like there's a different feeling, a feeling of heaven is on earth. It's not somewhere out there we need to get to. So the more of that there is, the less reaching out there is of trying to solve problems, feigned problems oftentimes, out there, and using resources around us, projecting constantly, da, 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 propagating duality, dualistic thought. So these systems start to awaken bodily self-consciousness, to go beyond the small Y you into the big you, to realize that everything is already there, and relaxing into that. And as soon as there's relaxation into that, a lot of the outer efforts start to follow those rivers back into the ocean, into this cauldron of internal alchemy that is a super intelligence that we already have, typically way at the back of the mind, so to speak, until we start directing our attention towards that and using systems that increase our ability to expeditiously get there, so to speak. So the end goal really is simple. Regardless of your path, quote unquote, right? There is a path and there isn't a path. It's kind of contradictory, paradoxical. The end goal is to be more of who you are and wish to be, basically. So I'd like to make time for questions. I want to pause there and leave about seven or eight minutes to talk. And I just want to say that a lot of the stuff that I talked about has references to my academic work in, my, in the handout online. Uh, so you can, if you're more academically inclined, you can go and read that um, rather than talking so much about it in here, although we can talk after for sure. Um, and there's links to CAP and things like that. So my beloved wife is going to pass around uh, a sheet. If you're interested in being on an email list, I don't spam. If you don't, just pass it on. It's all good. Thank you so much for being here. So questions? Yes? Yeah. Upstairs, they're talking about climate crisis right now and how insecure our lower chakra existence on this planet is, um, or that's their perception or a popular perception. Other people think that's not true. Mm -hmm. How do you address that when a lot of us are like, I need land with a deep, you know, natural well on it and an AR-15? Can you, like... <laughs> 
Yeah. Which is exactly what I was just thinking about. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that's complex, really, because to some degree, one of the most powerful things they would do is let other people have their sovereignty. But we ha can create systems in place that encourage and nudge people in certain directions. Um, I don't want to comment so much on what laws we can create to change the world, you know, um, because that, that's, that's um, I think that's something we should all be thinking about, but that's very complicated. And in, other, in different societies, that could change around. But this super intelligence of the Tao that I was describing, this law of operation, is already in the environment around us. I'm, I tend to be this is a personal predilection. I tend to be more of a say yes rather than no to things. So if you have an impulse and you experience um, disagreement with the way someone else does something, which we all do, including myself, of course, what is it that you want to create that they're not creating? So you go and you create that. And you increase awareness and you, you know, whatever, like, put promotional dollars into its marketing and advertising so it fills up people's attention, you know. Because um, in a way, all you could do is, is present more of who you are, which sometimes has a neutralizing force. You know, as you develop this Tao self-essence and you, are, you start awakening, you start projecting things that are below people's thresholds of understanding. And that projects around you even quietly, you know, through just trans energetic transmission. So the effects, sometimes we think we just have to say and type everything, but that's not the only mode of transmission we can have. So um, it's super complex. I hope I answered it to, to, in some aspect, you know. Any other questions? Um, I think, yeah? Do you have a question? Great, thank you. Uh, I really appreciated uh, the reference to how to poesis and the self-reproducing right, mechanism of extending ourselves through technology. And my question was, like, why do you think science pay, pays so little attention to sympoetic relationships, right, where it's more focused on the collectively producing versus self-reproducing systems? And, and then, like, what, what did it mean for, for science and engineering to look into that? Yeah. So, let me know if, I've if, if I haven't understood the question correctly. But basically, in a sense, it kind of boils down to why we're trying to understand the individual human rather than the way that things all work together and self-organize collectively. Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we could barely understand ourselves to begin with. So, science, using the tools of, like, microscopes and derivations from that, we want to put people in a lab and say, okay, if we, got, if we understand this one human, we can understand more. But that's obviously, as you're alluding to, uh, kind of fallacious, you know? It's like partially right, partially not right, you know? So we get it one person in a lab, one animal in a lab, and we, we go into it, and we think we can understand how a complex system work, works. But these larger, you know, processes at the collective level are harder to understand. We have complex system science, too, observe that from a distance. So we can say, oh, look at all these patterns. But even still, complex systems, I feel, is, from what I've seen so far, and I'm not a complex systems expert, although I'm an enthusiast, it's hard to predict what's, cap what's coming next. So in a sense, we're, we're like, OK, that's too complicated. Let's focus on the one organism in the lab or you know, see what happens there. To some degree, a lot of the complex processes in a person or in a mind are represented also at the collective level. Um, they scale up through something called the power law and other mechanisms. So I think science is really just starting to get a handle on that. And we are actually also collecting a lot of data to understand that, you know, which goes back to that point of, like, accumulating more data. So where we put our resources, where we put tax payer dollars is a big question. So your question really brings up more questions for me <laughs> that I actually uh, find fascinating. Um, so that's one thing that PhD taught me is uh, you learn to feel really stupid all the time. <laughs> it's like you go deeper and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going. You know, I just know that it's not this simple. You know it's not that simple. So then what can you say? Well, I don't know. 
depends. It's a good question. I'd love to talk more about that, yeah. Anything else? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to frame this the best I can. I'm not sure I can frame it um, as well as I'd like. Um, you spoke of the Tao. Yes. And I think I understand it. it's within, it connects me to everything, and it also enables me to be who I am. Yes. I, I, okay. Um, I want to um, mention something and just ask you for your comments on it. Uh, and I'll try to put it in two ways, which hopefully are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. One is that in quantum mechanics, you have the superposition of the wave. It's everywhere all at once. <clears throat> then it collapses into a material manifestation, a particle or whatever. Okay. Um, now, what I want to say is that the particle, the, the manifestation, can be in union with the superposition. And I think that may be a little bit what you mean by the Tao. Now I'm going to go to what you may think, and many people may think, is a very unusual thing to say. But in Christianity, you have an, a transcendent God then you also have, in some sense, an imminent God in the person of Christ, mm -hmm. but they are in union. Mm -hmm. They are in union. And uh, in Christianity, you also have the notion that a human being can do the opposite, namely a human being, and this really is in Christianity, can become God. Mm -hmm. It's called divinization. It's sometimes called sanctification. Um, and I just wonder if you can... I'd really love to see a, 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 a unity between the Tao that you're talking about and what I'm talking about. And I'd like to believe there is something like that, but I can't quite wrap myself around it at this stage of the game. So I'll stop and see if you have any comments. Yeah, that's a fascinating... Uh, set of uh, intellectual challenges that point, try to point towards, let's see if we can bring these various things together. Um, before I forget, uh, mention, uh, maybe take a look at uh, the paper that I called Mind Plexus um, in Linked. It's in my do do document. It's about how to create um, an AI that can have non-dual awareness. You know. <laughs> But it's basically looking at the architecture of non-dual awareness. So once that starts to settle in, there's non-dual awareness is divided more or less into two parts, uh, Trekchot and Togial. So Trekchot is non-dual realization, mostly through just third eye uh, awakening and kundalini piercing. And then the other part is Togial, which is the play of light, in which you start to see light lattices inside your body. And the fruit of this is, in theory, after about five or six decades, the dissolution to the rainbow body in Tibetan Buddhism. This has occurred in Hinduism as well. Uh, Dr. Francis Tiso wrote a book called Christ and the Rainbow Body and the Resurrection. Yeah, good guy. He lives in uh, Italy. Um, Harvard Divinity School, very bright guy. And he theorizes that Christ achieved the rainbow body. It's hard to know, but his disappearance suggests that if we're talking about Christ as a historical person, whether or not you believe in that. Um, but cr a lot of Christ's mudras are actually indicative of sacred heart awareness. So he's doing this, he's doing this, and that's below Anahata Chakra. So that sacred heart space, when you couple it with the uh, third eye, that starts to unfold non-duality and the play of light. Um, that's taught in CAP to some degree, the Kundalini Awakening process. So these systems, you know, the Tao is basically like a, a mirror, a hologram, and that they talk about them in Taoism. They, these various terms change from system to system, but they all really converge in different ways depending on whether you're you know, looking at dualistic the, um, uh, metaphysics or non-dual metaphysics or just systems that try to achieve non-ordinary capacities like psychic ab abilities. But basically the microcosm and the macrocosm, and they're both reflections of each other. So one exercise I would like to do for quantum awareness is Basically, what causes um, 
basically entanglement is the coarse graining through our intelligence. So a dog is going to coarse grain the world differently than a human being. So one question is, how do you coarse grain, how would a tree or a mountain or the sun or the Milky Way coarse grain you? And you find that you just don't even really exist. It's like an ant, like, you know, it's, it's, our concerns drop away really fast. So I'm afraid that's all the time I have, but I'd love to chat more, or you can check out my website or all of the above. So I'll be around and probably for the rest of the day. So thank you so much. Yeah.